unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Proverbs 23, verses 7. The scripture I'm going to read is no stranger to people who have been in the faith for some time. And of course, many have taken in account to explain and teach it. As the Lord reveals even tonight, in this hour I feel, in the period that we're in as a church, and in the times I feel that the things that are happening outwardly, I feel that there are certain messages that God is directing us to minister, to share, to preach in this hour. If you go back when Jesus was speaking to the fallen world of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says that you see the signs of the clouds and know which day it's going to be. You see the sky red and lowering. And he told them, for you see the morning and know that it's foul weather. He says, they design the face of the sky, but you cannot design the signs of the times. Now, of course, it was ancient wisdom and part of which was uh, of the forbidden wisdoms in the teaching of the signs of the sky and the sun. And those were teachings of fallen angels. And Jesus is trying to tell the hypocrites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, that they have advanced in forbidden knowledge of fallen angelics, but they know not the signs of the kairos. They know not the signs of the spiritual timings, the appointed times of God. And I believe that that's what separates the church from the rest of the world. God has given us the ability to design the signs of the times, the signs of kairos, the appointed times of God and the opportunities are available. Even in this hour, I believe that God is speaking to us in a very significant way and the things that i believe he's speaking through the church in this period are preparing us for a greater glory to come of course a lot is happening in the world but that doesn't mean that god is not up to something i believe that god is up to something bigger for the church and i believe that after this whole period we're going to come out more victorious than we were before in jesus mighty name so the bible says in proverbs 23 verses 7 he says for as he thinketh in his heart so is he as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Now, when we share that kind of scripture, when we raise that kind of statement, to many people it seems so obvious. It seems so obvious. Oh, I think I understand what you're saying. As a man thinks, so he is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. I think it's obvious that what you think you are, what you think you become, you become what you think. Yes, but there's a depth of revelation in understanding of this that seems so obvious. Again, I've shared many times with believers that sometimes God gets so convoluted in understanding by some individuals because of his familiar nature. Okay, God sometimes gets so hidden. He even becomes so confusing to some people because of how familiar he can become. And I've even seen people who have detached from God and disconnected from the true cause and purpose of their lives because of the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says that I fear, at least by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, he says that I fear that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Today out there in the world, there is a corruption that unfortunately begins from men which profess to be teaching the word. There is a corruption that we have given people on the altar and that corruption to the end has complicated a Christ that is supposed to be simple for them that dwell in him. And so the essence, the reason why we preach and must preach the way we preach is that we might revive again the simplicity that is in Christ for men. Because, again, if the Bible says that the complication of this in Christ realities is corruption, it's the reason why we see corruption in the world. It only means that the incorruptibleness of the word is in the simplicity in Christ. And so what we seek is to give simplicity to the message. They mean 
that the Christ does not have a demystification of mysteries, okay? But a demystification of mysteries after a particular nature in men of whom it is given to know the mysteries of God, it should come in a simplicity. That's what I'm trying to say, that it is given to you to know the mysteries of God. It's not to them, but to you it is given. To you it is given. To every believer it is given, okay? And so when we read Proverbs 23, 7, Okay? Some people say, oh no, it is simple. Yes. But in which simplicity are we speaking these words? Okay? The Bible says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So he is. Now I'm going to show you how, yes, simple, but deep this reality is. When I was reading the scriptures, I realized that the Hebrew translation for the word thinketh or thinks huh, is shawar. And shawar is only written once in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. It's only written once in the Old Testament, in the Bible, in, in the Hebrew. That word shawar is only represented once in Scripture. It's never written anywhere. It carries no reference anywhere. It's only written once. There has to be something about this that was mentioned once. There has to be something special about this. And shawar means to split open and the splitting of open he gives it in the picture of a gatekeeper okay shawar is in its most faithful essence recorded of a gatekeeper somebody who keeps the gate okay so when he speaks speaks of the splitting of opening right it is talking about the opening of the sword of a gate in other words the human mind is a get it's a get spiritually it's a get it's a get that opens for things in two. And it's a get that opens for things out of. Okay? And then when you understand that, you realize, of course, you cannot bring out what you don't carry within. Whatever you carry within is what comes out of you. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay? So when he speaks of as a man thinketh, okay, I would say, as a man opens the gates, so he is. You are what you have opened yourself to. And you only bring out in speech what you have opened yourself to. That is deep. In other words, when you understand it that way, it's more than just what you think for the hour. It's almost as though we don't even have control over what we think because it's determined by what we let in. Think about it. It is determined by what we let in. Look at a child when they're born. There are about four or three stages of human growth, okay? But the primary stage of human growth, when somebody is born as a baby, is mimicry. All right? The mind of a child is formed through mimicry. Okay? They say something, the child says it. Okay? You do something, a child mimics. You do something, a child mimics. Okay? If a child is raised around crippled people, that child might never walk, even though they have both legs and hands. If their eyes have never seen a man walking, if their mind has never been constructed to a normal human being standing up walking with both of his feet, that child might never walk. Why? Because they're mimicking. Their minds grow by what their gets open up to. Children start speaking language because they hear it. If a child is raised by a dumb person, okay, somebody who cannot speak, that child will not speak. It's human biology. Why? Because we adopt and mutate through what our gates of the mind open up to. There are people in the world who don't care what gets into their minds or who assume that it's okay to let in certain things and it's okay to let in certain words. It's okay to watch certain things. It's okay to listen to certain things. It's okay to entertain certain thoughts. But the Bible has said in Proverbs 23, 7, he says, as he thinketh in his heart, the Bible says, so he is. You are a result of everything you have let into your mind over the years. Everything you've let into your mind over the years. 
It doesn't mean that there's stuff in your life that has not happened outside your control. It only means that even though stuff has happened outside your control, you still had a way to put that stuff in control. You still had a way to heal that stuff. You still had an opportunity to align that stuff back to the order it must be aligned to. The Bible says that the spirit of the man will sustain his infirmity. Will sustain his infirmity. Will keep his infirmity. He says, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? There is nothing you cannot change. You might not be responsible for certain things in your past, but there is nothing you cannot change by the power of your imagination, by the power of your mind, by the gets of your mind. He says it's a get. You are a get keeper. So as you open whatever you open, you become what you open to. And as you close out certain things out of your life, so it is certain things will close out from your life. How I wish that people understood how deep this is how deep this is you'd not watch every news you'd not read every newspaper you'd not listen to every program you'd not entertain everything that everybody says you'd not give yourself to every thought and opinion of everyone out there because some of the media even out there makes people believe what they must believe and some of that stuff is true and some of it is not true. But some people don't know the power of how much they have let in. They don't know that right now you are where your mind has led you. You are where your gates have opened to. Imagination is a gate. It's a gateway. And these gates create eons. They create worlds. They create ages. This physical realm, earth, cosmos, it has its own way and patent. It has its own life and predictions. Okay? But when you became born again, you were born to another world also. Because you inherited faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says by faith we understand. It's an understanding that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That means the things which we see are not made by the things which we can see. But we understand that the worlds, the eons, the ages were framed by the word of God. When you became born again, the Bible says you were born of the word, the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Born again, not of corruptible seed, the Bible says, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, it liveth and abideth forever. That very word with which God created the heaven and the earth, the Bible says is the very word with which you were born of. That means you were born of the word that creates eons when you became born again. You are born of the word that creates worlds. So when we're talking about ages, when we're talking about periods, when we're talking about eons, that's the Greek word. We're talking about things that you command in the spirit realm that translate into the physical realm and cause your physical realm to be as you have expected because you have learned how to create certain things in the spiritual realm. If God created the world by the word, there is no other way you're going to create the world. There is no other way the worlds can be created. It says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Worlds, plural, eons, periods, times, ages were created by the word of God. There is no other way you can create. You can only create by the word of God. You can only create by the word of God. That means every word that goes out of the world, whether it's of God or or not, it is creating. It is creating. What your minds have conceived over the years has created where you are now. And if by God you are not helped tonight and understand this, you will continue in that spiral of failure, disappointment, frustration, sickness, bondage, witchcraft, Things will start falling out of line over time. Because some people 
have not been helped to understand how deep in this simplicity the reality of Proverbs 23, 7 is to the believer, most especially, as you think so you are. But I'm thinking positively. How do I know? You cannot think positively and confess positively and have negative lives. It's not possible. It cannot happen. It's not in the order. There is no law that can favor that, that can bring negativity in the life of a man who thinks a certain way. And because he thinks a certain way, he speaks a certain way. Remember, the Bible says when I was a child, he says, I spoke as a child. He says, I understood as a child. And he says, I thought as a child. And he says, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. All right. He says, I speak as a child. Why did I speak as a child? Because I understood as a child. And why did I understand as a child? Because I thought as a child. Again, it takes us back to the thought pattern. If your thought pattern is of a child, you'll understand as a child. And if your understanding is as a child, you'll speak as a child. No child speaks maturely. Oh, we have people who say, oh, that child speaks so maturely. They only speak maturely because you carry the full interpretation of what that child has spoken. But that does not necessarily mean that some of the words our children speak necessarily. They understand fully even the intensity of the words that they say. Or if a child really understands the intensity of the words that they say, that can only presuppose that there is a certain maturity in their thought. And from that, their understanding. And hence, the speech. The speech. Your thought life defines your speech life. If you want to know how mature a man is or a woman is, look at how they're speaking. You can tell whether they're mature or not. And that is, at one point in life, age-related. But at a certain point in life, it stops to become age-related. Okay? It stops to become age-related at a certain point in life. Some people invest in improving their thought, and some never invest in improving their thought. Even more beautifully, some people become born again, like you and I. And when you become born again, oh my God, the Bible says that Jesus Christ becomes your wisdom. The Bible says we have the mind which is of Christ. It means that your thought life is elevated and ought to be elevated. But many believers don't know how to tap into that elevation. They don't know how to connect to that reality. And because of that, we produce the results the world produces. We accept the things the world accepts. We move with the times of the world, the chronos of the world. We ignore the kairoses of God, the appointed moments of God to elevate us above the usual man, the carnal man. We have an advantage. Why? Because we are born of the Spirit. The Bible says that the carnal man cannot receive neither design the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually designed. When you became born again, you connected to a higher life, a higher realm. The world has a certain conversation. There's a way the world sees things. That's not how we see things as believers. Because he gave us his word. He has told us the vision of life in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is our ultimate vision. He is the eye through which we see God, the express image of the invisible God. Yet we regard him not in the flesh. And so that means the Christ vision has to be imprinted on your spirit to know who Christ is. And that vision can only be imprinted by the understanding of the mystery of faith. That may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. Through faith. And how does faith come? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God gives us the express image of Christ, the person. And through that, we know God. We know the fullness of God. We know the life of God. Now, when the Bible says he has been made your wisdom, it means you might lack in a few things in the way the world will see lack. But according to the DNA in which you've been regenerated, 
you have a full account of God's wisdom and understanding in you. Because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Let me shock you. Scientists have proved, I've been reading several papers and reports, scientists have proved that the brain is not the only part on a man that has memory. And that is why now they've coined the idea or the theory called cellular memory. Now, they believe now that there's non-brain tissues in a human being that also carry memory. For example, cells, okay? Cellular memory. Scientists have proved that now cells also carry memories. They carry memories. And because these cells carry memories, now they have to ask themselves a question, and many are asking, how are the memories of these cells and non-brain tissues programmed? And now science again is proving that these memories are programmed through the power of thought. That means your thoughts carry a communication to every cell in your body, to every organ in your body, to every tissue in your body. Your thoughts communicate to them. And these things carry memories. And so as a cell moves into your body, It is carrying a memory of the pattern of your thought because your thought influences and molds the memory of cells. Do you know what that means? If you wake up and you feel a pain in your heart and then your thought drives you, ha, huh, I might be having a heart attack, that has registered in your mind. Your mind starts to influence and mold your cells into preparing for an attack, a heart attack. Because that's what your thoughts have planted in your cellular memory. And a man dies. Why? Because he thinks death. There are many people who have been diagnosed with diseases and they've lived on with diseases. Okay? And one day they sit them down and explain to them exactly what they're suffering from and the disease starts to speed up. There are instances of people who have lived with diseases undiagonized and they've lived full normal lives. And the day they're diagonized with a disease, their body starts dying. Why? Because the cells, the tissues, the organs have responded. Their memory has received an influence and a molding. They've received a seed that death is coming. There are people who are healthy until they were diagnosed of something. Because the body responds. It is influenced by the power of your thought. It is molded by the power of your thought. Not all the people right now who are dying of COVID virus are dying because they have the virus in their body. Some people dying of COVID virus are dying because their minds, their thought lives are void of faith. They don't have an answer in their mind. We have had survivors and we have had people who have died of diseases, not only COVID, many sicknesses. Oh, and some will say, oh no, you know, it's just luck, it's chance. You know, some fall sick, some don't fall sick, some it wasn't, probably for some it's dependent on how many diseases are in them, on some it's dependent on how old they are. Yes, that's science. But the Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So he is. So he is. Many years ago, I worked in a palliative care institution back in my university. I had uh, been enrolled, you know, as a student practicing under social work. And so I had an opportunity to practice in a palliative care institution. They used to look after the terminally ill of uh, cancer, stage fours and stuff. And... To my utmost shock, there are people whose, by the book, they were supposed to have died long ago and they were still alive. And there were people who were brought and they were not as worse as those that they phoned and they died way earlier than those that had appeared to be so sick. 
But every time you talk about those people who looked like were going to die but had lived longer, there is an attitude that these people had. There is a thought pattern that these people had. Any doctor would tell you. Any doctor, any physician would tell you that there are people who die from fear even before disease kills them. Because the world is full of fear. What else do they have? Do they have the world? No, they don't have the word. They're in darkness. Remember, the gospel is light. Any man that does not ascribe to the word of God is in darkness. How can they have faith in darkness? How can they believe in darkness? How can they hope in darkness? But yet, some even in that darkness have exercised themselves to live. And they have lived. Because some refuse to fear. Some simply believe that they're going to fight this thing and overcome it. And that's just health. Go to finances, go to marriage, go to businesses, go to careers, enter education. All of it is the same. There are people who are constantly attuned to negative thought. And they do not know that that's a seed of the devil. Satan has planted something in their spirit to destroy them through negative thought. Now, if things like cells in your body, so small that you need a machine to see, can carry a memory influenced and molded by your thought. What of the bigger stuff? What of the things that are bigger than that? Because God is trying to tell you that everything in the physical realm is interconnected. And there are certain things that come before others. Your thought life defines so much of whatever follows your life. It does. You see, let me share something here. In Jeremiah 17, verses 10, if you give me the Amplified, he says, I, the Lord, search the mind, comma, he says, and I try the heart, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. That means the law of God, such as the heart and mind, to reward a man according to his way. God rewards right thought. God rewards right thinking. He rewards right meditation. He rewards a right heart. There's a divine reward for men who know how to think the right thoughts, who know how to pattern their thinking in the godly understanding. It's there in Jeremiah 17, 10. He says, I search the mind. In other words, when he comes in the life of a man, he's trying to search your mind, looking through, to say, let me see where this man thinks attuned to my word. Let me see where this man's thoughts are appended to my will. And wherever I see the thoughts appended to my will, I will reward this fellow. Remember, we already say this, you know, common scripture. Oh, that the Lord rewards them that diligently seek him. He rewards them that diligently seek him. But let's have the conversation of that reward. Let's have the conversation of that reward. Huh? The conversation of that reward in the principles that are ordained for reward, your thought life is key. Your thought life is an underlying pillar of the reward that you receive before God. So when the Bible says that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, I have learned over the years that the path of a diligent seeker is justified by a sanctified thought. The path of a diligent seeker is justified by a sanctified thought. Your thoughts have to be sanctified. We need a sanctification of our thinking. The Bible says, be not conformed. Do not be conformed to the standards of this world. The Amplified says, do not be conformed to this world or this age, this eon. He says, do not pattern your thoughts according to the ages of men, the ages of the world, the periods of the cosmos, this age. The fallen age, the fallen world, he says. Do not be fashioned, the Amplified says, after and adapted to its external superficial customs. He says, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal, he says, of your mind, he says, by its new ideals and attitudes. So, he says, that you may prove for yourselves what is the good 
an acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable in his sight for you. He says the only way you can prove that is to transform, to change your entire mind through new ideals and attitudes. You know, there is a fallen age. The world of fallen men thinks differently. When a man of a fallen nature gets a headache, he reacts like a fallen man. When a man of a fallen nature gets a stomach ache, he reacts like a fallen man. When a fallen man, the unregenerated man, a man who is not born again, a person who is not a believer, gets problems in his business, he reacts like a fallen man. When they get problems with their children, they react like fallen men. When they get addictions, they react like fallen men. When they get in debt, they react like foreign men. When they're threatened to be killed, they react like fallen men. Now, when you become a believer, God is saying you cannot react like the world reacts. You cannot be conformed. You cannot be fashioned to the ages of a fallen nature, to the age of carnal men, to the age of a fallen world. The things that are in the fallen world, there's a way they are set against the destinies of men of that nature. They recognize a regenerated spirit. They recognize a born-again believer. They recognize a Christian. They recognize a child of God. They see you. They know that you are different from the subjection of fallen men. They know it. But many Christians don't know it. I've seen pastors who even criticize fellow ministers for saying that divine health is for a believer. They have a problem believing that God can keep you in divine health. They have a problem believing that. Yet, when they're giving the salvation story, they're saying, receive the life of God. Okay? So when you receive the life of God, what happens? The Bible says you become part of his body. You are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. So as the Bible says, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. For if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. And all things are become new. And all things are of God. So when you become a new creation, some people, when they preach the salvation story, they only give you a story that will prepare you for heaven. But will never make you a victor on earth. When Peter saw that, he says, hey, by his stripes ye were healed. He did not say, by his stripes you shall be healed. He did not say, by his stripes you will be healed. He did not say, by his stripes you could be healed. He didn't say, by his stripes you might be healed. No, in 1 Peter 24, he says, who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins, he said, should live unto righteousness. Should, should, not might, not could, not will, should live unto righteousness. And because of that righteousness imputed unto us by faith, he says, by whose stripes ye were healed. Is that present? Is that a future tense? No, it's a past tense. By his stripes ye were healed. When he was wounded for your transgressions, when he was bruised for your iniquities, when the chastisement of your peace was upon him, that particular hour, your healing took place. And it was effected the moment you believed God. We go for healings all the time. We teach healing in the world. And men get healed. Even those who have not received Jesus Christ. Because they operate under the faith of us who believe. And because he told us you shall lay hands on the sick, whether they are born again or not, and they shall be healed. You shall cast out devils in my name. You shall raise the dead and cleanse the leper. We lay hands on them. We give them of a life that we have received in Christ. The Bible says in him you are complete, which is the head of all principality and power. Disease is a power. It's ordained under the order of certain principalities. He says, for we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spirits of wickedness in high places. But the Bible says, but you are seated in Christ far above all principality, all power and might and dominion and every name that is named in the world also in the world which is to come. Every name that is named. Every, you are above COVID. You are above HIV. You are above Corona. You are above cancer. You the believer. You, you, you the believer. He says you are above 
all principality, all principality, all principality is your cellular memory attuned to that reality. Does every cell in your being know that a virus cannot enter you? Does every organ in your being believe that disease is not your portion? Does every fiber and tissue of your being believe that God has ordained you for divine health? It can only get to that reconciliation if your thought life is attuned to the word of God. But if it is not and you start thinking sickness, the memories of your cells start transacting and providing for the sickness you're thinking. The world starts to prepare for the poverty you were thinking, for the lack that you were thinking, for the inefficiency that you were thinking, for ineffectiveness that you were thinking. The Bible says, for as a man thinketh, so he is. So he is. So he is. That's why we tell people, you must have a sanctified imagination, a sanctified mind, a sanctified thought. A sanctified thought. And the thought is only sanctified through the reading of the word. No man diligently seeks God without a sanctified thought. If a man seeks God without a sanctified thought, that man is seeking in vain. He cannot see God. Because they that worship, the Bible says, must worship him in spirit and in truth, not in emotion. In spirit and in truth, not in feelings. In spirit and in truth, not in tears. I'm not saying it's wrong to weep in the praise of God. There are people who weep in ignorance. And there are people who weep in the overwhelmingness of understanding. There's a difference. No diligent seeker does not carry a justification of a sanctified imagination. And a sanctified imagination, a sanctified thought, is aligned to the opportunities of the God life. God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly presence of Christ. All of these things are here and amen to the glory of the Father. He says, whatsoever you shall ask and believe, you shall have it. All things are possible to him that believeth. Yes, they are possible. The opportunities of the God life are available. But they cannot be activated. They cannot be put into condition of manifestation if the thought life of a man is not sanctified. What do I mean by this sanctification? This sanctification is through truth. It's, it's through truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. He says, for thy word is truth. And because God's word is truth, the only sanctification that you have is in scripture. And when the thought is sanctified, you are aligned, you are positioned, you are placed in the direction of the opportunities to live the God life. There is no sanctification outside the word of God. It's not there. Or if there is a form of sanctification that is outside the revelation of God, then that's a deceived sanctification. And the results of that are only temporary, only for the short, for the fall, when they are attested under the harder stuff. God has not called a believer to fail. Oh, and I know some believers might not agree with me. And some of them, it's not because they really read the word, but some of them, it's because of the theology that they have been taught over the years. Thanks be to God, the Bible says, which always, oh, you would have given an excuse if you didn't put always. But he says, Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Oh, but I fail in Christ also. You don't know who you are. You don't know what he has put for you. The Bible says he always causes us to triumph. Always causes us to triumph. And the Bible says, and makes manifest the server of his knowledge by us in every place. The server of his knowledge by us in every place. In other words, when you are triumphant, when you see success in every area of your life, you're going to cause people to come around you to start asking questions. How do I do it the way you do it? And when people start asking, you now start emitting the knowledge of God in every place. Everywhere you are, you are the written epistle. The Bible says, known and read by all men, he says. You are known and read by all men, he says. 
He says, even as you are manifestedly proven to be that epistle ministered by us, written not with ink, he says, but by the Spirit. You're written by the Spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, he says, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You are an epistle written by the Spirit. That means the Spirit seeks the vindication, the justification of you as a believer. That's the essence. That's the Spirit of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. The Bible says he was manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says he was justified by the Spirit. He was justified in the Spirit. He was vindicated in the Spirit. The Spirit vindicates. When I say I'm a child of God, there is evidence that proves that I'm a child of God. When I say thanks be to God, which always causes me to triumph, there is evidence around me that I'm triumphant in every way. When God looked at a believer, he didn't see a conqueror. He saw more than a conqueror. He says, nay, nay, nay. He says, in all these things, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more. We're not just conquerors. We are more. We're not just conquerors. We are more, 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 more than conquerors through him who loved us. How can we not enjoy that victory? How can we not love that? How can we not accept that? How can we ignore that reality? How can the world heal when the believer does not take that? How can we people have answers? No, the thoughts are not sanctified. The imagination is not sanctified. Why? Because many people's thoughts are ordained by the rudiments of the world, by the cunning craftinesses of men which lie in wait to deceive, by men which preach doctrines of devils, even as doctrines of Christ, by men which teach doctrines of men, even as the doctrines of Christ. And many Christians have amassed this and even become emotional. But there is nothing I'm saying that is not in the word of God. The mind must be sanctified. Your thoughts must be sanctified. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, he says, that finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, he says, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, he says, think on these things. And he says, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. He shall be with you. But here is the mystery. Thank God that when he was speaking about our thought pattern, the sanctification of our thoughts, the first thing he spoke was truth. Remember John 17, 17, he says, I have sanctified them through your truth. Now in Philippians here, 4, 8, he says, whatsoever things are true, firstly true, <laughs> before they are anything, they must carry their bearing from truth. And then, because they are true, they become honest. Because they are true, they become just. Because they are true, they become pure. Because they are true, they become lovely. Because they are true, they become of a good report. Because they are true, they become of virtue. Because they are true, they become of praise. And it says, Think on these things. Imagine a man who's trying to define something praiseworthy, but without the foundation of truth. Imagine a man who is trying to define virtue in character and in anything that touches his life, but without the foundation and backbone of truth. Imagine a man trying to define lovely and love without the foundation of truth. Imagine a man who is trying to define just without the foundation of truth. Imagine a man trying to define honest without a foundation of truth. All these things become firstly truth to become anything else. They begin from the foundation of truth. They begin from the edifice of truth. When that is built, then I can define what's lovely by truth. Then I can define what is of good report by truth. Then I can define beauty by truth. Then I can define wealth 
by truth. Then I can define health by truth. Then I can define joy by truth. Then I can define victory by truth. Then I can define peace according to truth. When you look at the peace that is defined in the word, it is the peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ. We talk about the wealth which is in the truth. It is where moths cannot go. He says, born again to an inheritance, incorruptible. Why is it incorruptible? Because it's begotten through the revelation of truth. Love seeks to be simply friendship and intimacy. It becomes agape, which is the love of God, because it is defined in the edifice of truth. If a man cannot begin from truth, that man cannot define anything as it ought to be defined. So, whatsoever things are true, primarily, then define the honesty. Then define the justification of those things. Then define the purity of those things. Then define the loveliness of those things. Define the beauty of those things. Define the good report of those things. Define the virtue of those things. Define the praise of those things. And he says, think on those things. And he says, and whatsoever things you have learned of me, whatsoever things I have taught you, he says, those things receive, take those from me. And he says, and the God of peace shall be with you. He shall be with you. He shall be with you. What am I saying? You can never choose to think right without the foundation of truth. You can never imagine right without the foundation of truth. You can never meditate right without the foundation of truth. And if you cannot imagine, you can't think, you can't meditate right, you're going to have a very deceived understanding of what is good, of what is lovely, of what is of a good report, of what is victorious, and anything there is in the world. It has to begin from the revelation of truth. That's the sanctification of your thoughts. I have sanctified them through your word. Sanctify them through your word, Jesus said. For your word is truth. When you read the word of God, what does it say about divine health? That's what you must think. What does it say about wealth? That's what you must think. What does it say about peace? That's what you must think. What does it say about joy? That's what you must think. What does it say about life? Do you know the world is following the news of a virus in the world? Some more than they have even ever read the word. Do you know how many people are on their phones and tablets, screens and computers and televisions following every latest this, every lettuce that, every lettuce this, every lettuce, every lettuce thing. And you probably have spent six or seven hours today alone on radio, on television, on a laptop, on a computer, listening, opening the gates of your mind to whatever the world is thinking about a virus. But you've not opened your heart to what the Word of God says. More than ever before, the church of Jesus Christ must be investing in the word than what the world is saying. That's why men are gripped with fear everywhere. Because they are gets, the gets of their imagination, the gets of their meditation are being flooded with death and destruction across the world. Listen to me. The Bible says that when men say there's a casting down, you shall say that there's a rising up. I choose to believe in this hour that something big is happening on behalf of heaven and to the glory of God and the expansion of the kingdom of God. The church is going to be better. The world is going to be better after this because the church is in the world. That's what I believe. And I shared with somebody and I told him recently, I said, look, with what we've gone through, I have prayed in this spirit that may God do something in the world and in the church that will never warrant the closure and limitation of worship because of a virus. It shall be so. It shall be so. 
it shall be so. Because it says, whatsoever we bind on the earth, it shall be bound in heaven. He said, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. I choose to believe. And so wherever you are with me right now, I want to pray with you. Father, we thank you for your word because it has brought understanding. We have opened our gates to the negativity that is happening in the world. But now can we open our minds to what you are saying? Can we open our thoughts to what you are saying? Because as the world is recording deaths, what is your word saying? Because Jesus says that the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Where is the life in the death that is taking place across the world? In the death in the human bodies, in the death that is taking place in the economies of the world? Where is the life? God, open our hearts and our minds to attain the God thought. For the sanctification of our thoughts can only be through the truth. And the truth is your word. Speak to us, God. I pray for people who are sick right now of any sickness. I speak healing in your body in the mighty name of Jesus. Why? Because it says by his stripes he were healed. I speak to families that would be struggling with anything, financial issues. I speak healing. I speak to your finances. Somebody's finances are limping. May God deliver you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. May God set you free right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak for reconciliations in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because you've heard our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, you say, you know what? As you were speaking, I realized that my mind needs to be sanctified. And you can only be sanctified through the truth. And who is the truth? It's Jesus. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody gets to the Father except by me. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're there right now, I want you to repeat these words and say, Lord Jesus, tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and rose again for my sins. Tonight, my life is changed. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.